Do you believe we are at the end of time? Yes. You know, I heard it said yesterday a couple times that we've been preaching this message for a long time. Have we not? Since 1844, the great disappointment, not quite yet 169 years, 168 and a half years, but we're not 168 and a half years away or past that. We're 168 and a half years closer to the Lord's coming. I don't know what you came here to see. Don't know what you came here to hear this morning. But my prayer is that you will not hear me. You will probably see me. But I pray that you will hear the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart. Present truth. What is present truth? Present truth are the messages that we need to hear today in order to prepare us for the soon return of the Lord. Is that correct? That's what we need to hear from our pulpits today, not just here today in Silver Spring, but all over this world. I would like to welcome those who are tuning in online, those who will be watching later on YouTube. I want to share with you my testimony this morning and tie it into something that is very relevant and very pertinent for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning that we have the wonderful privilege to be able to come as a church family to be able to worship you corporately. And so, Lord, we invite your presence to be with us, to abide not only with us, but also to abide in us. And Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, may they be acceptable in your sight so that all men will be drawn to you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Many people have asked by looking at me, they try to figure out, what what are you? They've gone around the circles. Um, They try first with Koreans. But I'll just make it easy on you. Just hit the largest body of people in the world, and you can't go wrong. I am Chinese. However, there was an interesting conversation I struck up when I was in Zambia doing an evangelistic series. The the taxi driver looked at me, and he said, uh, Oh, you from China? I said, No. Well, where are you from? I said, well, you guess. So he tried to guess. He went all over Asia. <laughs> he tried Korea, Japan, Hawaii, Polynesia. And I said, no, I was, I'm Singapore. I was born in Singapore. Oh, so you live in Singapore? I said, no. <laughs> then he said, uh, so... Where, where do you live? I said, well, you guess. And then he said, um, you live in America? I said, yes. So your passport is American? I said, no. <laughs> I said, my passport is Canadian. He, I basically left him scratching his head. He wasn't sure where I was from. My parents emigrated from Singapore to Toronto, Canada. I was two years old. So some of you who have been to Singapore, if you might know people I know, don't come up to me and say, do you know so-and-so, because I left before I was two. I grew up in Toronto, Canada. I grew up as a Seventh-day Adventist, in a Seventh-day Adventist home, having morning worship at the kitchen table. I didn't go off and do drugs. I didn't spend time in prison. I didn't come out of one of these things to give you this amazing testimony. I grew up in the church like the majority of you. Growing up in the church does not ensure that you also have passage to the heavenly kingdom. I grew up as a Laodicean. I didn't know much. I was baptized at 13, but that in itself did not give me entrance into heaven either. In fact, I I was baptized like many of us who have been baptized when we're younger, but we're not fully grasping the message. When I was uh, in high school, my parents never sent me to Adventist school. The thought was that the kids are no better there than at public school. You've heard that before? 
I have a different take on that because it follows in line with what the spirit of prophecy tells us that even the best public schools are still no better than the worst Adventist schools. There's just something about that. But my parents sent me to the public school, and I grew up in the public school system. I was very involved with music. Ever since I was, before I was six years old, I started playing the piano. And then in, in the fourth grade, I picked up the violin, started playing the violin. And then when I moved to another school in seventh grade, they didn't have violins anymore, so I had to drop strings, and I went to woodwinds, and I, I, the teacher looked at me and said, what would you like to play? And I was a little boy at that point, seventh grade. I looked at all the instruments, and I said, I would like to play that one, which was the tuba. <laughs> the problem was it was bigger than I was, and I couldn't take it home every day. So I opted for the clarinet. I was self-taught on the clarinet, went home, brought it back. I was playing already a couple songs the next day, and the teacher took a liking to me. By the time I hit high school, now you can experiment with all the instruments. So I was picking up all the different clarinets, all the saxophones, trombone. Then I could finally play the tuba. So while I was in school, I decided, you know, I wanted to become a music education teacher. I decided I would go to Union College in Lincoln, Nebraska. I studied music education there. I got burnt out in music. How many of you play the piano? This is a dying breed now. Only three of you? Come on, raise your hand. How many of you play the piano? See, there's not many young people that are practicing every day that are playing. My father would make me sit at the piano one hour every day. He would actually stand sometimes by me with a stick. <laughs> I had the coins on my wrists, you know, to make sure my wrists were leveled. All those things. Even when we went on vacation, he would still find a piano somewhere. But when I went to Union College, I got burnt out in music. I had to practice. Well, in a semester, a normal semester, you take a full load is 16 hours. It usually is about six, five, six classes. Well, my advisor did not advise me correctly. My first semester, I had 20.1, 21.5 semester hours. I had 13 classes. Two of those hours were practicing piano, taking piano credits. And during that time frame, I had to practice 20 hours a week. I was burnt out in music. Do you understand? Those of you who went on to college and university and you became doctors, you practice on the latest technology. But see, when you're doing music, somehow they don't give you a nice Steinway to play on. They put you in a room where the piano has been there since World War II. <laughs> the windows don't shut, and it wasn't tuned since World War II. I got burnt out. I, I was tired of playing. I mean, I was, I was a pianist for the voice teachers. So when they brought music to me, basically I had to sight read. They would throw music in front of me and say, play, and you'd have to play it. I was in all the select choirs. I was a principal chair clarinetist. All these things, I, I, I was so burnt out. Then a friend of mine said something that was music to my ears. He said, why don't you go as a student missionary? I said, I'm not interested. Well, why not? He said, you get a year off of school. I said, what? <laughs> I'm all ears now. I'm interested. Where can I go? They said, well, you need to look at the call book and decide where you want to go. And I, so I looked at the call book. I really wanted to go to China. I don't know anything about China back then, so I thought, let me go to China. Doors were closed. Then they said, well, what about Japan? That's in Asia. I said, no, they're a little different that way. So I kind of looked, okay, what's between China and Japan? Korea. So I looked at Korea, and I thought, yes, that looks close enough. Let's try there. So I went through the interview process, and I decided, I made it through, and I decided, okay, I'm going to go to Korea. Many years ago, you'll remember the former youth director for the, uh, I think it was NAD or General Conference, was Elder Dick Barron. Do you remember that name? He was a very, very tall guy. He was sitting on the plane in first class because he did not fit in the coach area. <laughs> when he was seated there, um, 
there was a conversation that came up because all the student missionaries were there and we were all going to Korea first and then we were fanning out after the orientation week. And somebody came to me and they said, so Alden, tell me what you're teaching for your Bible class. <laughs> I said, I, I, don't, I don't have a Bible class. They said, where are you going? I said, Korea. They said, oh no, you have a Bible class. You, you teach five English classes and you have one Bible class. I said, no, I don't. They said, yes, you do. No, I don't. Yes, you do. No. Finally, I went to Elder Dick Barron, and I said, they say I have to teach a Bible class. Elder Dick Barron got out of his seatbelt, stands up, towers over me, looks down, and he says, well, yes, Elden. You're going to Korea. You have a Bible class. Now, this was back a number of years ago. If there was any such thing as a hijacker back then, I was ready to hijack the plane and go home. It may seem funny to you, but you have to understand, I didn't know my Bible. I mean, I knew, I knew a few Bible verses. John 3.16, everybody knows that, right? Um, For God so loved the world that he gave that, yeah, that one. Matthew writes, uh, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know that one. And then the other one in Genesis 1, in the beginning... God, yes, God created the heavens and the earth. I had those, those are memorized. But you know, you can't, you can't give a whole Bible study on those. Remember, you can't lead anybody closer to Christ than you are yourself. So I struggled with that. And I went into my first Bible class. I decided, okay, I'm going to teach from the book of Matthew. Now, you have to understand how this works because they take, they take the English classes. They pay for the English classes. But the Bible classes are free. Get it? So they come in and they get to understand what the Bible says. But at the same time, they take the class because they can practice English freely to be able to talk. Now, I was 19 years old when I went over to Korea, and I'm teaching people who are doctors and lawyers and very educated people. This is like homeland to many of you who are from India or other parts of the world where educators are esteemed rather than disrespected. And so even though I was 19 and I was teaching people much older, they would still highly respect you. But in this class, they like to argue with you. And that's exactly what this man did. He wanted to argue with me and argue with me. And he asked me a question that I didn't know the answer to. I ran out of the classroom. I ran to my friend's classroom. I was hyperventilating. I, I tend to be a little bit excitable. And my friend calmed me down and he said, Just study it and get back with him. <laughs> Sounds easy. Okay, so I went back to the classroom and I said to the man, I don't know, but I'll study it and I'll get back with you. He said, okay. So I went home, studied, 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 came back, and I bequeathed him of my knowledge. <laughs> he said, okay, I understand. Then he hit me with another one. <laughs> I went back and I studied, studied, studied. Over and over this happened until one day... He asked me the question, and I was about ready to say, I don't know, and all of a sudden, my mouth started speaking. I'm looking at my mouth, speaking. <laughs> I'm looking at him, and he's going. Amen. When my mouth got done, I said, uh, do, you, do you understand what I said? He said, yes. I said, good, tell me what I said. <laughs> do you see? For the very first time, God spoke through my mouth. I'd never had that feeling before. It was a very odd sensation. It was very different. But God spoke through my mouth. People came up to me and said, you should become a pastor. You know my feeling towards that? Back then, I would have said, step into this. There was no way I wanted to become a pastor. Are you kidding? Pastor? No, no, no. I went to Andrews University, changed my majors. I was burnt out in music. While I was over in Korea during the student riots, I picked up photography, and I really got into photography. They offered, I, I was on a plane, long story short, I was offered a position photographing in Hong Kong at 20 years old. They were going to offer me today's equivalent of $100,000 to be able to photograph, and I said no because I... I have to study. <laughs> I, I don't even know. I mean, I was self-taught in photography. 
So I went to Andrews University. I studied photography there. And while I studied there, I got my degree. And the next week after I received my degree, I marched down the aisle to receive my wife. This Tuesday, I think, let's see, today's the 8th, 9, 10, 11, 12. Next, this Wednesday is our 25th anniversary. You're probably looking at me thinking I'm kind of young. I was married at 12. <laughs> 25 years. It's been a challenging 25 years because three months after I graduated, something happened that changed my life. You see, I, I was supposed to work for a, a photographic company in Chicago selling professional photographic equipment. That's what I was going to do. But somehow things changed along the way. The job that was promised me was no longer there. And a guy came up to me and he saw my photography work hanging up in the gallery and he said, I could use somebody like you. I said, really, for what? He said, to photograph aerial photography. His name was Tom Pangborn. He was, a, he was a Seventh-day Adventist pastor, but he was disillusioned, I guess you could say, because he fell out of the church in the early 80s through the Desmond Ford movement. Sold all his stuff, wasn't keeping Sabbath anymore, and he hired me to photograph for him. And that was great. We were photographing sailboats during the week, uh, during the weekends. He worked on Saturday, I worked on Sunday. During the week, we photographed ski, uh, skiers or golfers, depending on what season it was. And during this time frame, we would sit down, we would talk. When we photographed in the plane, it was a 172 Cessna. The Cessna is a four-seater plane. You understand? It's very, very tight in the cabin. In fact, if I'm the pilot, the co-pilot is sitting right next to me. Well, I'm not a pilot, so I sit in the co-pilot's side. And it's so small in that plane that being on the right side of the plane, if I put my left hand out, it's out the left window. It's a four-seater plane. There are two seats behind for one American or three Indians. <laughs> Very small back there. And in that plane, now, on the left side, understand this, in your car you hit a button or you wind it down and your window goes into the door, right? Not in the plane. In this plane, you actually open the window by undoing the lever and you push it out because it's hinged at the top and that's what you do. Well, in order for me to photograph, the 172, the wing is up high, which is an advantage for us because we don't have this wing that we have to photograph and try to hide. There's only the support strut. So when I'm photographing, we would take that window, undo the bracket, and push it all the way up to the bottom of the wing, and then put a piece of wood in there to hold it open. Now I can photograph out that plane without any obstructions. We went out Labor Day weekend, September 4. We got to the airport. It was a very windy day. We got to the airport, and we saw the windsock. The orange thing was sticking straight out. Now, if you know anything about wind socks, if they just hang there, it's not very windy. If it's kind of like this, it's a little windy. If it's sticking straight out, very windy. If it's not there, it's a hurricane. <laughs> it was sticking straight out, and I said to my boss, I said, I, I, are you sure you want to go out? It's kind of windy. He says, yes, let's go. He was an opportunist, so we went up. He said, you get the camera equipment, put it in the back seat, and I'll do the pre-flight and fuel up the, the, the gas tanks. The gas tanks apparently were inside the wings. That's what kept the fuel. And so while he did that and he did the pre-flight, I loaded up the camera equipment. We hopped in and we took off. The moment those three little wheels left the ground, we were like this, just hopping in the air. The clouds were very low at about a thousand feet. So we stayed just below the clouds as we flew over to where the lake was. And the lake was only a few miles away. We got to the lake. And when we arrived there, you could see the dots of all these little J-22 sailboats that we were going to photograph. We were going to photograph that and then head down. This was in northern Michigan. Have you ever been there? It's up by Mackinac Island. 
We were going to fly from there down to Chicago to photograph the big Chicago Mackinac race. We never made it that far. When we were photographing these boats on Boyne Lake, we came down to about 400 feet. And Tom gave me the go ahead. Let's do it. Looks good. So I would open the window. I grabbed the big camera behind me. It wasn't a 35 millimeter. It didn't produce negatives this big. It produced six by seven centimeter negatives. Very big camera. It was a Pentax six by seven. So you're holding this big bazooka type of camera. And as I'm photographing through there, you can only get 12, uh, set, six, let's see, seven, six by seven. You only get 10 pictures and then you have to change roll. That's it. So they better be good pictures. Every time we would bank, the plane would always bank to the right side. Do you know why the right side? Because that's my side. Because if we go this way, what am I photographing? Clouds. Clouds don't buy pictures. So we would photograph this way. And we would go round and round, just flying round and round this way. And as we went round and round, I would take pictures. And sometimes we would get really close to the boats. I mean, really close. You could hear them on the boat yelling at us, get out of our wind. First boat, no problem. It was a little windy. Second boat, no problem. Third boat, no problem. Getting all the pictures. But in between the third boat and the fourth boat, he reached up on the dashboard and he hit a switch. I didn't know what that switch was. That switch I found out later was to lower the flaps for landing. We're over the water. What he was trying to do is slow the plane down even more. We're going only 25 knots in the air. That's not very fast. So long as you keep your wind speed up, it's not bad. But the moment you let your wind speed down, you know what happens? You fall from the sky. Imagine, this is a plane, the wings. We would bank like this. What happened is we lost lift. He went, as he was fighting around the corner with the wind, we went this way. Now, that's not bad. You see jets do that all the time. They, you know, for the air shows, they go like this, but they're going really fast. They have to go fast in order to stay up in the air. We weren't going that fast, so we went like this. And then we started to fall. In order to compensate for it, he corrected for it, and we went this way. <laughs> and we dropped. We hit the lake at over 125 miles an hour. Terminal velocity. Some people say, well, what happened at that point? We hit so hard that we blew out the windows of the plane. The left wing was bent back 45 degrees, up 45 degrees. It was very, it was very difficult because when you're, when you're falling, you see the water coming and you think, no, not going to happen. And the next thing I know, I'm underneath the water. Now, they say hitting water is like hitting a brick wall. The only difference between hitting water and a brick wall is if you hit a brick wall and you're alive, you can still breathe. But if you hit water and you're alive, you better hold your breath. This is where most people die because they've been knocked unconscious. And what happens when you're unconscious? Your body goes into the auto mode. God designed our bodies that even though you're unconscious, your heart still beats and you continue to breathe. Well, you don't know how to hold your breath when you're unconscious. And that's exactly how people suck in water and they drown. I was totally conscious. I remember exactly what happened. We were there, bam. All of a sudden, I'm in the water and I realize I got to get out. How am I going to get out? I mean, it was, it was like everything just goes into slow motion. Your, your whole life goes back, goes back in history, and you realize, look, you just graduated from Andrews University. You just got married. You just got this new job. And then all of a sudden, fast forward, and here you are in the plane. And I said, I've got to get out. That was a novel idea. I went for the door. I lifted the door handle, pushed on it, didn't open. People said, well, you weren't with equilibrium with the water. Remember, we blew out all the windows. We were equilibrium with the water. But my door got jammed shut in that accident. Interestingly enough, my door jammed shut, 
Pilate's door popped open immediately. But in the impact, my boss, Tom, we both slammed into the dashboard. His head went into the dashboard and his heart stopped. He was dead. I didn't know that. I kept my eyes closed. You wear contact lenses? Do you ever swim with your contact lenses? No, you don't do that. Contact lenses like water. There's more water outside there than are in your eyes. So it'll just move up and it's gone. So I kept my eyes closed. I didn't know. You just do what's second nature. I closed my eyes and I felt around. I felt him. I undid his seatbelt. I undid my seatbelt. Now, in a plane, you have two options in these style planes. You can go with the full seatbelt, lap and shoulder. You can go just lap, you can go just shoulder, or you can go nothing at all. I just had the lap belt on because I needed range of motion to be able to move around. Well, because of that, we both had lap belts on. We both slammed into the dashboard. What I didn't know was in the impact, you know how in a car sometimes you slide your seat back unless you have one of those fancy cars with all the electronic buttons and all that? But the old ones, you put, pull that lever up and you slide your seat back and then sometimes you have to wiggle it around in order for it to catch, right? And if you don't catch, what happens? Sometimes you come to a stop sign and you find yourself, Bleh. my seat didn't catch. And so in the impact, we were going much faster than slowing down at a stop sign, and it bypassed all the locks and slammed me right up against the dashboard. I hit so hard that I broke off the steering yoke with my chest. That's a solid steel shaft. I made it somehow out of the window. I remember saying, I've got to get out, and the next thing I know, I'm on the outside. I, I do not remember going through the window. I remember saying, I've got to get through, and the next thing I know, I'm on the outside of the window. I don't know how that happened. Now, remember, my eyes are closed, so I don't know which way's up. I was moving my hands. I was kicking and everything. I had jeans, running shoes, a, a light jacket on. And through all of this, I made it up to the surface of the water by God's grace. I remember taking this deep breath, and I tried to swim. I took about 10 strokes, and then my body said, mm, shut down, not working, pain. So I stopped swimming. That doesn't work so well. There were people that were, f that were in the other boats that we nearly hit. Two brothers were fishing. They saw the boat, coming, the plane coming down, and they raced over. One of them jumped in the water, and he grabbed a hold of me, while the other brother in the boat grabbed my jacket and hung on to me. Somehow a ski boat came. They got me into a ski boat, and I remember getting ready to sit down because my left leg and my left arm were not moving. I remember sitting down this way and then looking, and as I sat down, my left pant leg was ripped open. And I, as, it, as I sat down, I saw the bone of my left knee. And I thought, this is not good. They rushed me from there to the dock. From the dock, an ambulance came, and they rushed me to the trauma center. How many of you are in the medical field? A few of you? You know, I thought these EMT paramedics were stupid people. They kept asking me the same question over and over. What's your name? How old are you? Where do you live? They asked me about four times. Finally, I looked at them and I said, what's wrong with you guys? Just write it down. <laughs> I didn't know they were trying to make sure I was conscious the whole time. I felt like a broken record, record player going over and over. They were attending to my needs. They, they wheeled me into the trauma center. I was on a gurney. I had a neck brace. My foot was in an air cast. And they just had me like this the entire time. And I don't know. They, they asked for so many vital signs and all these things. Finally, the doctor came in, orthopedic doctor, and said, we got to take you in for surgery right away. OK. Took me in for surgery came out of surgery into ICU and then recovery and then, well, actually, I never made it out of cardiac ICU. The same doctor came in after I came out of the anesthesia. He kicked everybody out of the room. He closed the door behind him, and he came to me, and he stuck his finger in my face, and he said the words I'll never forget. Son, 
I don't know whether you believe in God or not, but he's the one that saved you because you're supposed to be a dead man. He said, let me tell you what happened to you. In the impact, somehow you got out of the plane. How? We don't know. Because the divers that went down to find the plane, to recover the other body, they, they said, how big was this guy that got out? They said, 6'1", about 180 pounds. Said, impossible. Why was it impossible? He got out the door. They said, no, the door didn't open. He got out the window, but the window's too small for him to get out. I remember when I got up to the surface, I looked around, and I remember seeing grease all the way down my left shoulder. It wasn't dirty grease. No, no, it was that golden, clean grease, clear. I sat in a 172 10 years after that accident, and I asked the aviation mechanic, look, I got out of this window, but there was grease on my shoulder. Where did I get the grease from? And he said, well, there's grease in the, the flaps, there's grease in the doors, and there's grease in the wheels. He says, but there's no way you could even rub that grease because it's all sealed off. And he said, even if you could rub up against it, he said, it would be dirty. And you said this was clean. I have a theory. My theory is that there were two angels there, one on the inside of the plane, one on the outside of the plane. Under the, the Lord's orders, get them out. So one put the grease on my shoulder, and he said to the other on the outside, look, you pull, I'll push. Get him out. <laughs> because in man's estimation, it was impossible. But the Bible tells me, is anything impossible for God? Did God already know what he had for me to do? He says, I know the plans that I have for you. Now let's back up three years no, let's back up half a year, or a year and a half before that. No, half a year. Half a year before that. I, three years, sorry. I'll get the record straight. Three years before that. I am in Hong Kong photographing. I meet a friend who wasn't an Adventist, who was a photographer. I met him on the plane coming. We sit down to have lunch together at the Royal Hong Kong Jockey Club, very high-end, ritzy place. He introduces me to a friend of his, and he, she says to me, do you need any connections? I said, connections? What do you mean? Then my friend from under the table just kicks me in my shins, and I was like, ow, oh, what? He says, this is Tara. Her dad is the CEO of ABC TV. Do you need any connections? And I held up my hand. I says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. She looked at my hands and she said, oh, that's very interesting. And I'm saying, what, oh? She said, let me see your hand again. And I gave her my hand. Never experienced this before. She read my palm. It's like, what are you reading? She says, oh, this is very interesting. You're going to become quite wealthy. And then she says, you like to spend money, both true, to a certain degree. Then she says something that floors me. Oh. I looked at her. Oh. She says, oh, you're going to almost die. Three years prior to the accident. Did Satan already have something in mind? Oh, yeah, he did. The doctor said to me, Here, here's the situation. In the impact, your seat broke loose and it slammed you up against the dashboard. So as a result of that, your foot got crushed in the gas gauge on the floor and you have five broken bones in your foot. They were kind of crushed. We didn't put any pins or anything like that. We just basically put a cast over it. And my foot was so swollen, it looked like a rugby ball. They had to cut and recast me five times in eight weeks. As a result of that, I got eventually out of that. I shattered one-third of my left kneecap. They went in there, took all the pieces out, cleaned it up, stapled it shut. I fractured my clavicle. I cracked my entire sternum. I lacerated my head going up, compressed two discs in my back, 
and also bruised my heart, which caused me to be in the cardiac CCU unit for 48 hours on open heart standby. He said to me, son, you're going to be in the hospital for 30 days. Don't even think about getting out any sooner. By Friday, they allowed me to go to Tom's funeral. It was a closed casket, and they brought me in in a wheelchair. My foot was sticking straight out, and they brought me in, and they sat me right here in the middle of the church, nobody in front of me. There was a casket in front of me, and I cried like I've never cried before because that should have been me. That made me very upset. I went back to the hospital room, and I was screaming at God, what do you want? What do you want with my life? Tell me. There was no answer. I would scream. I would yell. There was no answer at all. I would wake up in the middle of the night in cold sweats, feeling the plane falling from the sky and saying, what do you want, God? The doctors said I would be in there for 30 days. I'll tell you, by the grace of God, I walked out of that hospital in a special pair of crutches eight days after the accident. I have no issues with my knee. No issues at all. My back hurts once in a while. From there, I sat around not knowing what to do. I got a call from the company that I was supposed to work for. They called me and said, Alden, if you want the job, it's yours. Within three days, my wife and I we moved to Chicago six months after the accident. I got my job that I wanted. I was selling photographic equipment, professional photographic equipment. These were the people, the serious people who use pro gear in the U.S. and around the world. My clients were pretty much anybody and everybody that used photography. I became a consultant for the FBI, the CIA. I would sell to pretty much anybody. Then they started going to outside sales and they put me into the outside sales department. I was dealing with all the universities around the United States. I was lecturing for the National Park Service in Washington, D.C. on historical photography. I was setting up battleships with photo studios. I set up Harley Davidson studio. All these people. When digital cameras first came out in the early 90s for consumer use, I was selling the first trained person selling them in the United States. Back then, it was $36,000 for a digital camera. I became the top salesman for the company. And then they moved me into national accounts. I did a lot of things, so I thought. I was handling $20 million for the company. And I thought I was doing all of this. What I didn't know is God was training me for what he wanted me to do. You see, when I sold equipment, you have to know your equipment in order to sell it. I had 30,000 line items to sell. That's a lot of stuff you got to know. And you know what? It was a trade-off because people would call me and say, hey, Alden, I, I want to buy some camera gear. What do I buy? I would always ask them the same questions. How much money do you want to spend? What do you want to use it for? All those questions. Now, I have one line item that I sell, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. Tell me what your need is, and I'll give you the product. And it's a very simple one. It's Jesus. Whatever your need is, it's Jesus. You got depression? It's Jesus. Whatever it may be. From there... I worked in that company for five and a half years. They were grooming me to take over. They said, go get your MBA. We're going to pay for it. But I was hungry for status. I was hungry for worldly title. You know, last night's message, this world was my home. I wanted the title. I, I wanted to be a, you know, a vice president because it looked good on a, a business card. You know, people give you, what do you do? <coughs> I'm a vice president. <laughs> it just looks good that way. I was hungry for status. I became a vice president. For a year and a half, I worked for them. But that didn't give me any success. One night, I woke up, 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm looking at the clock radio, and it's, it's 4.00. And I was like, why am I up? I was a night person. Why am I up? And then all of a sudden, I'm looking, and I hear this voice. Out of the darkness, I hear this voice. And the voice said, Alden, 
there's much work to be done and the workers are few. I said, no, no. I mean, I, seven years, Lord, you never called me. I, I, I don't want to go to the cemetery, I mean seminary. <laughs> the next morning, same time, same words, same voice. I said, but Lord, uh, I'm a vice president. I can't quit my job. Whoa, don't ever tell God that. <laughs> Six months later, I got pink slipped from my company. I mean, how, how do you go from being top salesmen, top producers? I mean, my clients were World's Finest Chocolate and Ace Hardware. I was more partial to World's Finest Chocolates, mind you. But I, here I got, I got laid off. How does that happen? Now, let me go back for a second to April. When God spoke to me the next month, the youth leader says to me at the church, this is Hinsdale, Illinois, Chicago. He says, Alden, you need to take over. Now, let's go back two years. Going back two years, he said to me, Alden, come and work in the youth because I think you would be a, youth, a great youth leader. So he trained me. Now we go forward two years. He says, I'm leaving. You need to take over. And I said, no, I'm a vice president. Then I get laid off. They went through 50 resumes. They couldn't find anybody. So I went and I spoke with the senior pastor. I said, let me tell you what God told me a few months ago. He grabbed me by the neck, stuck me in his car, and drove me to the conference office. I was hired as the youth pastor. From there, I went and I studied youth ministry at Andrews. I didn't want to go for my MDiv. You understand? Because MDiv is Greek and Hebrew. I didn't want Greek in Hebrew. I wanted to work with young people because if you're working with young people, guess what? Greek is Greek. Hebrew is Hebrew. That doesn't help. <laughs> I wanted to understand how to work with them. Look, when you get a kid that calls you and says, look, my friends, I'm at my friend's place at the nature preserve. He's got a gun pulled to his head and he's ready to pull the trigger. What do I tell them? No amount of Greek and Hebrew is going to save that kid. From there, I pastored in many different conferences, Illinois, Carolinas, Texas, and then in 2002, I started my own ministry. Traveled all over the world preaching revival and evangelism and to youth. And then just the beginning of March this year, the Lord called me back to ministry in a church. That's where I'm at in Texas. I've got a few minutes here to be able to tell you a couple things that are pertinent. I would like you to turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul writing to the church at Philippi says the following words in verse 7. What things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. What are these gains? We talked last night about worldly possessions. This world is not our home. These things that we gain in this world are things that hold us to this world. Some pay a lot of money for these things. But look at what verse 8 says. Remember, this is Paul. Wait a second. Before you look at that, understand, this is Paul that's speaking. Paul, who went on the road to Damascus, and he got blinded by that light, and God had a redirection in his life. Paul, instantly, in that moment, he became blind. He was told to go to the, this street called Straight Street. Sit there in this place, and you're going to wait. At the same time, Ananias was told, go to see this man Saul. Ananias is like, a, a, Saul? You mean Saul of Tarsus? You, you mean the guy that's coming to kill it? You want me to go see him? Ananias, go. He is a chosen vessel of mine. Ananias went and gives Saul his sight back by laying hands on him and the scales fall from his eyes. Paul now sees totally differently than when he was Paul, when he was Saul. Now, 
understand this. Looking at verse 8, this is what Paul writes now. He says, yet I count, yet I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of some things, all things, and count them as, depending on which version you have, New King James says rubbish. That's kind of a British terminology, isn't it? I like better what the King James says. Dung. He says, I count all things as what? Do you know, do you know what dung is? It's poo-poo. <laughs> Look, it, it, sounds, it sounds cute. It sounds funny. But understand this. In respect of what Paul is saying, he says, I count all things as poop. That means all those vehicles out there that you spent lots of money on, you know, you fix up. I did this too. I was in college. I had BMW. I had nice mag wheels. You spent a lot of money on it. You know what? That, that's a poop mobile. <laughs> and those homes that you buy that you, you lavishly decorate, that's poop. It's a dung home. This world is not our home. The more you put into this, you're not putting it into the people who you can take with you because you can't take this. Remember last night's story? It's just pavement. Paul is saying very clearly here that he wants one thing and one thing only. What is that? He says in verse 13, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal of the prize of the what? The upward call in Christ Jesus my Lord. That's what Paul wants. Is that what you want? Is it? You see... Here's the struggle that each of us face. It's found in Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus talks to his disciples in verse 24, and he says the struggle that each of us faces today. In the words he lays out, he says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his what? Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What a great irony in there. You want to save your life? Lose your life. You want to save it? Lose it in Christ Jesus. Because when you lose your life, young people, it's Jesus who comes and lives in you. Paul wrote in Galatians 2.20, It's not I who live. But Christ who lives in me, I have been crucified. That's what it's all about. You can gain the whole world, but if you don't have Jesus, you have nothing because life is a gift. Are you with me? He says in verse 26, For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? You can have all the dung of this world, but that dung will not get you into the heavenly kingdom. The passage for the theme of this weekend is found in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Paul is writing to his young son in the faith, Timothy. And he says to him, let no one despise your youth. Just because you're young, so what? What? May I remind you that the birth of our church was by young people. Amen. Ellen White. James White. There was an old guy in there. That was Joseph Bates. They needed godly counsel too. Don't forget about that. But understand this. Yes, you've read all the way to verse 14. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying of on of hands of the eldership. But I want to point your attention to the two other succeeding verses that were not mentioned. Meditate 
young people, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them because life is a gift. Did you understand that? Life is a gift from God. What you do with your life is your gift to God. This is what the message is saying here, that your progress may be evident to all. Not that you would say, hey, check it out. Look at me. Forget about looking me. I have no light. I'm a reflector of Jesus Christ. Don't look at me. Don't clap for me. Look to Jesus. Verse 16, take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Why is it important to heed doctrine? Because I'm going to tell you why. There is all winds of doctrine blowing around today. You can, I can tell you all the different ones and probably some of these you've never heard before. I started taking account of all these different winds of doctrine. You ever heard of that message by W.D. Frizee? He has a wonderful message. Godly man. He preaches this message called the ministry of heresies. There's a ministry in heresies. You know that? And what that does is it weeds out those people who know not the doctrine. They don't know what the pure, sanctifying truth is. And at any whim, they're gone. People struggle with this. They're anti-Trinitarians. Holy Spirit's not part of the Godhead. Excuse me? Then who do I baptize with? Father, Son? Well, what does Matthew 28 tell me? And Holy Ghost. There's a lot of doctrines going on out there. He says, continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. You know, I, I hope and pray that all of you here are not planning just to walk away now and go home. We've got messages this afternoon. Three o'clock, there's a message. Four o'clock, there's a message. There's messages all the way through. And I'm telling you, the one that I'm going to give this afternoon, because I know that my brothers over here already gave their 30-second spiel to you before the worship service as to what they're going to be preaching on. But I'm going to tell you, I didn't have time now, but I'm going to share with you why I believe from the Bible and from the spirit of prophecy that we are in the last generation. It's a last generation theology. Some say, well, you're time dating. No, I'm not time dating. We are required to know when his coming is near. The signs are out there, but the biblical signs are there too. Make it a point of hanging around today for the blessing. I want to make an appeal to you. Those of you who have come here, especially the young people today, your life is a gift. Maybe there's something here that the Lord had triggered in your thinking today, saying, you know what, time is short, and I need to change the way I'm thinking about things. I need to change my focus, and I need to change my goals. If the Lord spoke to your heart to say, and, and prick your conscience, and you're going to make some changes, that's the Reformation part. If that's you, will you stand? You don't have to be young. Could be old as well. Amen. Not a big call. Just asking who got pricked with that. Praise God. I pray that today will also be a blessing for you in many other areas. Don't just sit there. Engage yourself. Take notes. You can have a seat. Thank you. Take notes so that when you go home, look, this is, this is by far an Adventist community, is it not? I know about Adventist communities because I just moved from one at Andrews University. We all have the head knowledge up here, but that's not going to get us in the kingdom. It's a heart knowledge of him. Head and heart must work together. Do you understand? We, we know Jesus is coming soon. 
We cling to this. We sing about this. We have this hope. You ever been to a general conference session? 70, 80, 90,000 people singing this song. We have this hope that burns within our hearts. Hope of what? The coming of the Lord. Don't forget that hope. Burn for Jesus.